welcome. Uh, my name is Mokorzata Kazimierczak and I have a pleasure to moderate today's um, discussion, which is entitled uh, Above and Under the Radar, Freedom of Artistic Expression um, in Japan, Turkey, Hungary and Poland. So one of the main objectives of uh, ICA is to defend and promote freedom of expression and thoughts. And the protection of freedom of artistic expression lies also within the guiding principles of the UNESCO 1980 recommendation concerning the status of the artist, uh, which calls on member states to protect and defend artists in their freedom to create. And UNESCO, of course, is important uh, in our context uh, because ICA is affiliated with uh, UNESCO. Freedom of expression is also um, referred to as a fundamental right within the UNESCO 2005 Convention on the Promotion and Protection of the Diversity of Culture Expressions. Um, however, uh, the UN Human Rights Treaties uh, and the Convention contain exceptions. And uh, these are the restrictions that can be applied to expressions that damage the rights and the reputations of others, that threaten national security or public order, or public health or morals. And this is where the problem begins. Um, the shrinking space for, for the freedom of expression has been a concern of many ICA members, as well as many institutions, many NGOs that are devoted to protect human rights. So the conversation today will focus on both the above the radar, so obvious cases of legal repressions, and the under the radar, uh, subtle practices leading to um, self-censorship. And the idea uh, to connect uh, countries such as Japan, Turkey, Hungary, and Poland stem from the fact that some time ago, I uh, asked Yukiko Shikata, the president of ICA Japan, about the censorship cases in Japan. And then she sent me a video of a meeting of Asian ICA sections uh, moderated by Andrew Merkel, who is uh, with us today. And uh, it was organized by ICA Japan. Um, and I was listening to these presentations. Uh, many situations sounded like home, like Poland, like Hungary, and like perhaps like Turkey as well. So I thought that it would be interesting to share the experiences and create some platform of exchange uh, as this for sure uh, is something that will uh, can strengthen us. So um, we will discuss the most recent cases of censorship, but also um, in order not to make it just uh, like the session of uh, uh, complaining, uh, we also would like to talk about the strategies of self-defense, resistance, as well as possible ways forward. So today's uh, participants are in the alphabetical order. Uh, uh, Firat Aparogu uh, in, is an art historian, art critic, and independent curator. Uh, he lives in Istanbul and works as an assistant professor at the Altun Bash University, Department of Common Courses. He has curated many exhibitions in Turkey and abroad, uh, published in many international art magazines. Uh, he's also a vice president of ICA International and ex-president of ICA Turkey and um, a director of the uh, 53rd Congress of ICA in Istanbul in 2021 that happened online. Then we have uh, Jakub Dobrowski, um, who is also a PhD. He graduated in both law and art history, and he's an assistant professor at the Faculty of Artistic Research and Curatorial Studies uh, at the Academy of Fine Arts in Warsaw. And um, together with Anna Demenko, he's the uh, co-author of the Bible of, uh, on censorship in Poland between uh, 1989 and 2010. Um, and its English edition is entitled Censorship in Polish Art After 1989, Art, Law, uh, Politics, and was published by Mosaic Press in 2019, although the Polish version was published um, uh, much earlier. And uh, you can read it like a <clears throat> prime story. <laughs> Then we have um, Andrew Merkel. He's an art writer, editor, and translator based in Tokyo. Uh, currently, he is an editorial director of Art Week Tokyo, writer of many for many international magazines. Uh, he's also a teacher. Uh, between 2018 and 2021, he taught in the Graduate School of Global Arts at um, Tokyo University of the Arts. And he is also a standing a committee member of ICA Japan. Uh, Gergely Noc, <laughs> a member of ICA Hungary. Uh, he is a journalist, editor, author. He lives and works in Budapest. He currently works as a freelancer and he is a PhD fellow at Elta University in Budapest. He is also the initiator of East Arts Art Mags, 
a collaborative project of art magazines in the East Central European region. And he's also one of the founders of the Off Biennale Budapest, which has become the largest civic contemporary art initiative in the region. Mm, and uh, he also contributed to several reports dealing with the state of artistic freedom and freedom of speech in Hungary. And last but not least, um, we have a special guest, um, Sarah Wyatt from London who is a campaigner and researcher on freedom of uh, artistic expression and human rights. Um, and among other things, she directed uh, the Penn International's Freedom of Expression program. She was a coordinator in Amnesty International's Asia Research Department, so um, she knows everything about every region. Um, she has been an expert for Council of Europe and UNESCO, and she works for the civil society organizations such as Free News and Penn International, and she is also an author of the most recent report on the freedom of expression for the Council of Europe. And um, let me remind you just <clears throat> for the, <clears throat> those of you who don't uh, know that the Council of Europe uh, also uh, comprises of not only the member states of the European Union, but also uh, other states. So this is like 46 states altogether, including Turkey. And um, Japan in this context is also um, uh, like this uh, observed state or uh, how it's called or uh, um, sorry, I can um, tell, tell us later. And then um, uh, just a little bit about, about myself. I'm a, a historian, curator, critic, assistant professor at the University of the National Education Commission in Krakow. Um, since 2020, I'm the vice president of ICA Poland and, and ICA International. And um, the, the way I got um, involved into uh, most of you is that the, I uh, co-created the report um, on censorship in Poland between 2017 and 2021 for the ICAS uh, censorship committee. And um, this was uh, put later uh, online. Uh, it, was, uh, it was hanging on the, our website and also on the website of uh, ICA Germany. And thanks to this, I think it was uh, Googleable. And this is how Sarah found me. And this is how uh, the other uh, Artistic Freedom Initiative also uh, found me. And that's why I got involved into um, the workshops on the freedom of expression uh, organized by Sarah in uh, Ljubljana uh, last year and this year. So um, I'd like to uh, start the first round of questions. Um, so I'd like to start with a brief description of what affects the shrinking freedom of expression in our countries. Uh, and I'd like to start with Sarah because Sarah probably has the most global view on the situation. Uh, so I'd like to ask you, Sarah, what is the state of artistic freedom and what is the impact of populism on it? As Margaret has said, um, I've been working on a number of projects, global projects, but more recently have been working with the Council of Europe on artistic freedom in Europe. And I know there are a number of you here who are from outside Europe, but as Margaret has said, that many of the issues that we face in uh, Europe are actually shared elsewhere. And Japan is actually a very good case in point. The Council of Europe um, asked me to, to do a study of artistic freedom in Europe. Um, last year. And uh, my first response was, well, actually, I could do that with my eyes shut if we only look at what we now term ab above the radar, that is arrests and uh, imprisonments and, uh, and, and other attacks. But what really has been interested me was interested to me was the fact that um, artistic freedom is suppressed much more so not just in Europe, but elsewhere, by what I've turned as under the radar, that is other ways of uh, suppressing creative freedom, which might create situations of self-censorship. What I'm going to do is just very briefly run through the report that was published last year and which will be up, uh, updated next year. Um, and uh, hopefully that will start some um, discussion. So this was published in February this year. Now, now I've got to find the next screen. Huh. Okay. Now, as I said, the, uh, this report is specifically on artistic freedom in Europe. And uh, this, these figures come from the, another organization I work for, Free Muse, which does a global report. The global report had something, if I remember rightly, about uh, documented, documented something like one and a half thousand cases. I should have to say that this is probably an underestimate. It's only those kind of cases that are reported. Interestingly, when you're looking at Europe, you will see that there are uh, around four, over 400 reported attacks, 
in 28 countries, and this represents 32% of all recorded attacks globally. Again, you have to remember that um, these are affected by the accessibility and being able to access the information in many countries due to language, due to um, suppression of freedom of expression, lack of access, that this is only um, a small amount. But it does give you at least a taste um, of, of, of the problem and that there is a tendency to see um, that to see artistic freedom as being something that happens outside of Europe, except obviously the obvious countries like Hungary and Turkey. But just to give you a flavour of that. Now, what are effects, what are the range of threats to artistic freedom? This is above the radar. Anti-terror legislation. Now, this is so often misinterpreted. Um, it will cover issues like um, minority rights or calls for, um, for independence. Um, and we see that a lot in particularly in countries like Turkey and Europe, but also elsewhere. Security legislation in China, for instance. It's a major issue. Then uh, we have uh, insult rules. Now, artists in particular um, work with satire, and uh, so they are quite liable to be uh, to be uh, accused of insulting those in power. So that's another major issue. We have laws on blasphemy and insult to religion. Again, uh, artists tend to want to push the boundaries a little and find themselves um, uh, subject to, to these legislation. We also have violence and intimidation by non-government groups, and this can I, to my recollection, that hadn't happened in Europe, but certainly last year there were many cases of artists who were actually killed, either by government forces or by uh, by non-government groups. Some of them inspired by their governments, and certainly uh, not um, not tackled by, um, by by the governments. We had a special issue for vulnerable groups, particularly minorities, women, LGBTQI, and others. And there's also a whole subsection of online dangers of the uh, trolling and threats and shutting down of the internet, of which there have been many reports. This is just a very broad overview of the kind of issue that uh, artists in Europe and indeed elsewhere uh, suffer. Just to give a taste of the uh, use of anti-terror laws, for instance, um, Kurdish theatre had been particularly uh, particularly affected and, um, and even uh, even classics such as uh, Moliere have been banned as being pro-terrorist. Uh, pro I believe we have a Turkish speaker here who can probably um, uh, speak more about that. Insulting states, presidents and kings. Um, again, from a European context, what is extraordinary is that we have a case of one EU country of a person, an artist, a rapper fleeing one EU country to get political asylum in another EU country, that's Pablo herself from Spain, who has now um, have got political asylum in Belgium uh, for his raps, which were insulting to the king and anti-terror. You've got the famous case, um, well, famous for a while, uh, in Germany of the comedian Jan Berman, Berman who extraordinarily um, was uh, brought to court on the request of, uh, of Erdogan, who used laws existing in Germany that enables uh, foreign governments uh, to agitate cases um, where there are laws about insult to foreign ministers with foreign state symbols. Um, and what is extraordinary in the European context, the number of countries that have laws that make it illegal where you can be prosecuted for insulting your king or your president or indeed someone else's or for trampling on a flag. Blasphemy and religious insult is a huge issue. Um, again, this is something that has been particularly so in, um, in countries in South Asia uh, and indeed elsewhere. Um, and, uh, but what has been some good news in recent years, in Europe anyway, is that these blasphemy laws have been um, removed in some countries. Not so surprisingly in Ireland, where this has been a long discussion, I think the law was removed in, uh, in 2016, but maybe more so in countries like Greece and Malta, which are a much more religious country. One of the questions I'd like to have of, of, uh, of, of um, the, the countries where these laws have been abolished is, had there been a problem, have people now been running around blaspheming and causing all kinds of trouble now the laws have been lifted? And that doesn't seem to be the case. 
But of course, there are problems with the return to blasphemy laws uh, in countries like Denmark. Amazingly, Denmark uh, only completely removed its uh, blasphemy laws. I think it was 2017. But now with the, uh, with the, the, the cases of uh, burning of, of the Quran and other incidents in Denmark and Sweden, they are now thinking of returning laws, which will make it an offence to, uh, to uh, attack, shall we say. Um, they don't say specifically in this proposed law, which is before um, Parliament at the moment, they don't say specifically Christian or, or, or Muslim texts, but they talk about more broadly about uh, objects of, I'm, I'm just paraphrasing here, objects of uh, religious sanctity, which is really problematic. I mean, it's problematic anyway with a, when you when you refer to a, a particular religion, but to have such a broad idea. And going back to this, that terrorism, insult, and blasphemy can be so widely interpreted and misinterpreted that in fact they are useful in uh, useless, shall we say, in law. Talked about under the radar impacts. Um, we've seen in Europe a great deal of what we're referring to as undue government intervention, that is interfering in the leadership of museums and other cultural institutions, loading them with pro, uh, pro government supporters, um, with their funding uh, strategies, with um, enabling or interfering in the programs of of the cultural institution there's been a great deal of that constantly and i think many of you here will know much more about it than i do there is institutional censorship where you know maybe your your theater might may be very keen on the work that you're doing but will not dare to put it up for fear of losing their own support if we put up this kind of work we'll lose our sponsorship we'll lose our government funding and we might get a uh, a gang of crazy guys uh, outside the cinema or theatre um, threatening our staff and the audiences and actually scaring off our audiences. Um, we have the special problems of underrepresented groups, and this was particularly interesting for us and Margarita will remember from our meeting earlier this month in Ljubljana, where we had quite a number of people from minority groups talking about the special problems that they have. Um, very interesting. Underlying all of this is the status of the artist and the general precarity of being an artist, um, the finance, in, you know, and the fact that um, culture is one of the least uh, financed um, sectors, um, and that this very precarity can make one less uh, willing to do works which are more uh, challenging. Um, do you call it self-censorship or do you call it pragmatism is one of the questions. And also interesting is the role of funders as inadvertent censors by the choices that they make or the conditions that they give to their funding. And it was another topic of big discussion in Ljubljana um, earlier this month. Um, the report itself uh, covered up to 2022, and um, I've since updated just some new cases to show that it is, uh, it is still um, uh, the, the problems in 2023. The book burning uh, controversy has had repercussions. For instance, in Sweden, um, you wouldn't necessarily call this censorship. This piece of work of veiled women was to be very prominent in the gallery, but the gallery was forced to actually remove, not remove it, but way, put it way back. It's very small, but it is actually a significant uh, concern that one has to uh, adapt one's work. Again, maybe it's pragmatism, maybe it's censorship. We have the continuing issue of right-wing attacks, particularly on works relating to uh, minorities. There was a case in, I think it was uh, Dortmund, uh, uh, of an exhibition on colonization, colonialism, sorry. And this and the workshop attracted um, threats of violence. And uh, in this case, the German police had to provide protection. This may indeed uh, make uh, anybody uh, involved think twice about what kind of material that they do. Many, many cases of um, museum directors um, being ousted from direct pressure or otherwise. We've seen cases in Italy where the director of the Egyptian Museum in Turin was pressured to resign after he, um, uh, he gave a discounted ticket for the, uh, an exhibition on Egypt for people from Arabic speakers. 
we had, as uh, you, know, you know, the case in Poland of the director of the uh, Pacific, uh, Asia and Pacific Museum. I'm sure we've talked more about that. These tend to be around issues uh, of, uh, so we say, minorities. In Spain, um, there was a huge campaign against the Society Museum director, more to do with his, um, of his showing of contemporary art and with the right wing wanting to see more sort of historical nationalistic art. And again, this is a really interesting topic that came up in Ljubljana earlier this year, um, early this month, where the artist talked about historical revisionism and uh, having in a very precarious uh, situation where there's very limited funds, the artists sometimes have to do work um, that fit the government agenda um, or don't choose not to do the work at all. Um, as I said, the good news, we had Malta, um, it also not only did it uh, remove blasphemy laws, it uh, has now amended its law to enhance artistic freedom, in this case, very specifically talking about the right to satire. Um, so we do see some positive developments over time, as a legislative change does take a long time. As Margaret Atta said, um, I mean, we could forever talk and complain, um, but we need to take action. Um, one of the things that we're doing through the Council of Europe is to uh, encourage a state to stand by their obligation to protect artistic freedom. We have a manifesto on artistic freedom and Council of Europe, and there are other manifestos and statements uh, internationally. Though one of the problems has been, and it's not just with states, but there's a real lack of understanding what is artistic freedom across the board, and that is one of the, 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 the issues. We're seeing um, we increasingly artists. When I start, first started working on artistic freedom, were seen as peripheral or unimportant. When I'm talking to my colleagues in international organisations and civil society organisations, and I think due to a lot of the work, particularly in the last ten years, um, they're beginning to understand the importance of artists and including them in their in their work. Um, artists and cultural institutions themselves lack the, um, on the whole, lack the capacity to monitor attacks on artistic freedom on their own country. This is due to resources, it is due to lack of expertise, and this is something that we want to encourage more support for. We are um, also, and this is Council of Europe, and just also other, other institutions are providing platforms and uh, networks for artists to exchange, because one of the things that I also noticed is that when I'm dealing with the human rights organizations and the civil society organizations, there is a one big gap. Artists are very rarely invited to take part. So you don't really hear their experience. And this is something that we're pushing for. And we really need to have create a public understanding of the importance of artistic freedom. Artistic freedom is very often a controversial topic and also alongside the public general lack of uh, respect, shall we say, is the only word I can think of, of the role and the status of the artist itself. And this undermines everything from supporting artistic freedom, uh, for standing up when people are attacked, through to just funding projects to enable um, creativity. So I'll stop there. Um, and I'm sure we'll be talking in more detail with the rest of the speakers here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, well, it's it's very interesting, of course, what you said, and um, uh, it's we should underline the, uh, the, the fact that all these laws that uh, are in power in our countries are also applied very arbitrarily. Yeah, so this is not really something that you know where the line is and you can simply not cross it because sometimes the way they are interpreted are super random. Yes, yeah, so like to just give you an example, like two sticks that resemble the cross with something that resemble genitals in Poland was a, a case or throwing three eggs at the door of the church. Uh, for this, the, the person was uh, condemned yeah, for insulting religious, uh, religious feelings in Poland. So, uh, so this is very arbitrary and um, and uh, this is against this uh, argument that, okay, we have a conservative society, so we have conservative laws, but this is not really so simple. 
Um, and also um, just a small comment on the Asia Pacific situation because the Asia Pacific uh, Museum, the director was removed by the, actually by not by the right wing, but actually by the civic platform, um, Marshall. And this is also something that probably Jakub will talk about later that uh, censorship is not really uh, only uh, the, the thing of, um, of the right wing government. So, um, all right, so then let's move to Andrew. Uh, if you also could tell us about the, the, the cases of artists um, who are accused, for example, of the breach of the obscenity law. Uh, yes, like uh, Megumi Karashi, for example, was like the, the most the famous case. And uh, we know about that. And well, maybe there are also other sensitive topics. Um, and if you could tell us who and how tries to limit the freedom of artistic expression in Japan. Yeah. Um, well, first of all, I think Sarah's presentation was uh, really tremendously uh, informative and enlightening. And I think also this notion of above uh, above the radar and under the radar uh, is really uh, fitting for the, the situation in Japan. Uh, one of the problems we have here is that although the Constitution prohibits censorship, um, uh, there's a lot of gray area about what censorship is, how to define it. People are reluctant to um, call something censorship uh, when it gets removed from an exhibition, for example. There's always a lot of sense of, well, let's figure out if it's really censorship or not. Um, and I think, uh, you know, that, that sort of um, creation of a, of a sort of atmosphere of, of uh, fog or ambiguity also uh, suppresses a broader public response uh, to these situations. The obscenity law that uh, you mentioned is actually an artifact from the 1907 uh, criminal code that uh, survived uh, through the post-war occupation and, and the uh, sort of um, modern uh, constitution. And in that sense, it is uh, very entrenched in, in Japanese as a society and precedent. Uh, the law states, or the law criminalizes the distribution, sale, um, display, or possession of, uh, in public of obscene uh, documents, drawings, or other objects. Uh, and it was amended in 2011 to include um, a clause for ele electronic media and distribution. Um, so, I mean, I think, uh, you know, on the one hand, this law mostly pertains to the adult entertainment industry and, and in practice it, you know, um, it, you know, the, the, the way that we encounter it most often is that genitalia uh, have to be blurred in some cases. Uh, but as you say, uh, it's, it's also sort of a bit arbitrary. Um, so, uh, you know, in, 2008, for example, the Supreme Court uh, ruled uh, on a case involving a Robert Maplethorpe's uh, book of photographs that it was mostly artistic content, and they actually allowed it to um, stand as 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 an artistic work. Uh, so that would suggest um, an improving situation. But then, only a few years later. Uh, we have a string of um, cases that target um, sort of people who challenge the gender norms in the country. Uh, so uh, the artist Roku de Nashiko is one example. Um, she was uh, making works about her, well, she's a self-proclaimed vagina artist, and she was making works uh, kind of reclaiming the female body or the female genitalia. Um, uh, and these in, included uh, 3D scans of her genitals that she uh, was giving to supporters. And, and so uh, she ended up being uh, arrested and charged with the obscenity law. There are also um, a case of uh, a Singaporean photographer, Leslie Key, who in 2013 uh, showed an exhibition of sexually suggestive uh, photographs, and he was actually arrested along with the uh, gallerist um, of the place where he was exhibiting. Um, and then uh, another case that uh, sort of avoided 
actual legislation, but still involved um, kind of a police mechanism. There was an exhibition at the Aichi Prefectural Museum of Art in 2014, where a photographer called uh, Ryudai Takano was showing uh, photographs or a, a series of photographs in which he takes uh, nude portraits with another person. And some of these portraits involve two naked men standing together. Others involved uh, the artist who's a man with uh, a woman. Um, and someone came in and objected to the um, uh, depictions of genitalia in those photographs and called the police. And then the police came in and rather than um, taking down the works, uh, the, the solution was that uh, the, the artist chose to veil uh, the works and then they were allowed to be exhibited. So I think with the obscenity law specifically, we're seeing how um, it can be used to enforce uh, gender conformity in a patriarchal society. Um, but it is not, I think, I think it's also something that there's not a lot of uh, necessarily public uh, pushback against the law. What we're seeing uh, that is sort of really more concerning for me is um, incidents of uh, suppression of speech that involve uh, historical revisionism or uh, criticism of the state. And so one of the biggest events, in fact, of the past 50 years or so was the Aichi Triennale 2019 uh, where one of the displays in the Triennale uh, had brought together works that had been censored or removed from exhibitions previously in Japan. Um, so it's already a, quite a challenging display, but uh, in this sort of high profile context, works that were addressing the comfort woman uh, system of the uh, Japanese empire, works that were addressing the image of the emperor, works that were addressing the Fukushima um, uh, nuclear accident from 2011 uh, were all on display and they uh, became uh, the target of sort of right-wing uh, nat nationalist um, harassment campaign. And uh, so within three days of the exhibition opening, uh, the entire display uh, or that particular display was shut down. Um, uh, and right-wing or nationalist politicians were claiming that this was, you know, Korean propaganda, that these works trampled on the feeling of the Japanese people. And, and so there was also a, a kind of a, a, a storm that developed around uh, both sort of basically online trolls who organized the harassment campaign of people calling in uh, and even threatening at some point uh, the venue as well as politicians then adding on to it with um, sort of uh, their own statements. Um, the thing about the IG Triennale was that uh, artists and art professionals and curators both involved in the exhibition and uh, those who were not involved in the exhibition uh, organized and uh, put together a counter campaign uh, and eventually um, successfully lobbied the Triennale to reinstate uh, the display under um, sort of compromised conditions. But nevertheless, uh, it was a very important, um, I wouldn't say victory, but it, you know, it, it sort of prevented an outright catastrophe for uh, freedom of expression in Japan. Um, since then, we've had the pandemic, and 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 so we were sort of in a, a, a kind of gray area where we, we haven't really had a chance to digest uh, what took place at Aichi. Uh, but I think there is still a lot of uh, self-censorship or soft censorship that uh, takes place uh, in Japanese institutions, just as uh, Sarah uh, identified in her presentation. And so this is still um, an ongoing issue for us. Okay, thank you. Yes, uh, from what I remember when we were uh, talking in detail about the, the case of Aichi Trinale, that, um, okay, that the, the action, uh, the, the, the social campaign helped, and we can talk about it later, like what uh, precisely the methods were, but, uh, but then uh, it was some kind of uh, Paris victory because it uh, really, like in the following years, then it, uh, the funding was actually 
pretty much limited. Yes, yeah? so we can see that we def you defended it, but uh, of course it was not without consequences. Yeah. 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 But I think you know I, I think in 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 that case in that sense Japan is an interesting case because there is still space uh, to push back against even to, to even challenge the government as we saw with like the Maplethorpe um, uh, case uh, and and to push back um, in the Aichi case and I, th I think it's really important that uh, cultural workers and institutions um, rally to preserve or to protect our freedoms while we still have you know that that space to do it yeah Okay, all right. Uh, then I'd like to ask Hirat, uh, because uh, as we know, well, in this uh, competition, uh, you know, like uh, that we have during the, um, the Council of Europe uh, workshops, it's like Poland is always winning. But uh, not until somebody from Turkey <laughs> shows up. So, um, so the repressions of, in Turkey can be really, uh, really severe. It can be imprisonment, like in case of Osman Kavala, for example, yeah, that, that he received aggravated life sentence. Um, and you can also lose the job, uh, etc. So, uh, but it also is connected with the privatization of culture. And so, if you could tell us um, what are the methods of the of the government that the government uses to oppress culture cultural workers and what are the um, interconnections between the various actors of the public life. Well, thank you, Margot Zata. So, uh, <clears throat> uh, greetings from Istanbul. Uh, hi, everyone. So, of course, uh, these problems are the same for Turkey. Uh, and also, if we want to write, we can write a huge Bible of censorship, even from the Republican times to date maybe uh, during the late Ottoman times as well. Uh, the actual government, uh, we couldn't get rid of them, lastly, so we have to survive for another four years. Uh, but the actual government used various methods to oppress cultural workers and stifle the freedom of expression. So some features we can count uh, at first hand, as it told, imprisonment and illegal harassment, uh, which are very important problems because cultural workers, including journalists, artists, like Zehra Doğan's case, the Kurdish women artist, and writers and academics are often targeted with criminal charges, such as terrorism, which is a very serious accusation, and defamation or inciting violence. And these charges are frequently be used as a means to suppress dissenting voices and critical opinions. For instance, in 2017, the journalist Ahmed Sheikh was arrested as part of the Ergenekon investigation on charges of disclosing secret state documents. And then in 2011, journalist Jan Dindar was arrested on charges of making propaganda for a terrorist organization. And then two years later, Jan Dindar and Erdem Gül was arrested on charges of disclosing confidential state documents. And in 2015, journalists Boris Terkoğlu and Murat Savuncu were arrested on charges of membership in a terrorist organization. So in Turkey, actual government can use this word easily for everyone. So, and after that in trial, you have to defend yourself even without any, any, um, evident. So another, the second important point is that job loss and blacklisting is another case. So because, uh, let me give you an example. Uh, after the coup attempt in Turkey in 2016, uh, one year later, in 2017, the director of Ulak Bilim, it's a national uh, network of um, academic journals, Ulak Bilim, so the director of that organization informs that if there are people who have been dismissed or suspended from public service among those who hold positions such as editor, editorial assistant, referee board in all journals accepted in that organization database and benefiting from this service, the responsibility for reevaluating their status and taking measures regarding those who have sanctions against them belongs to the journal. 
So it requests that any changes to be made within this framework be notified to that database. In short, this Tubitak organization, it's an academy of science, uh, directly belongs to the government, prohibits academics who have been dismissed or suspended by the state of emergency decrees, which you know that Tayyip Erdogan can use this, uh, can use this option uh, easily. Um, at that time, we lost at around 5,000 uh, editors and editorial assistants and referees in that case. The process resembles the practice we often see in totalitarian regimes, you know, where people are who are not guilty of any crime, but whom the government defines as suspects for some reason. Uh, the third feature is censorship and control over media. Because the actual government exerts significant control over media outlets, influencing cultural production and limiting alternative narratives. So independent newspapers, we have just few right now. And magazines and TV channels, the critical of the government are either shut down easily or face legal challenges like blockades for some days and restricting the dissemination of diverse cultural expressions. So for instance, in 2016, uh, so the national newspaper Jumuriyet and another uh, online magazine or the TV magazines and the Hulk TV uh, was closed down. <coughs> in sorry, <clears throat> in 2017, arrests and trials of journalists critical of the government increased. In 2018, which is very important, the government introduced new regulations on social media platforms. These regulations made it easier to block content critical of the government. And in 2022, last year, the government passed the social media law in the parliament. So this law allowed the government to exert more control over social media platforms and block the content more easily. And another important thing is that the closure of cultural spaces, the government has also shut down cultural spaces like theaters, cinemas, and art galleries sometimes that showcase works critical of government policies. Um, in 2016, during the coup attempt and after that, some important institutions such as Istanbul uh, Municipal Theater and Dostas Theater as a private organization shut down. Uh, and in 2018, another important case, the government passed the Culture and Arts Act. This law gave the government more authority to regulate artistic events. And lastly, I can add the restrictive legislation. Uh, the government has implemented legislation that enables it to exercise control over cultural production. Uh, for instance, because you know that it's a funny thing, but we have a Ministry of Culture and Tourism together. And that ministry requires artists to obtain permits for artwork, exhibitions, screenings, or performances. Let me give you an example. One of my friends who is an artist, painter, uh, lastly, he, he wanted to participate in a group exhibition in Atatürk Cultural Center, maybe remember in the city center of Taksim. And then, the director of Atatürk Cultural Center gave to the artist a list. So in that list, you can see that I won't paint any painting, uh, including the content of political or content of uh, local values. You know that it's a very famous in Turkey, local values. So it's about gender, it's about sexuality, etc. In 2017, an art gallery in Istanbul closed down uh, because of an exhibition that criticized the government. And in 2018, a theater in Ankara was banned for staging a play critical of the government. And then in 2020, a music festival in Izmir was stopped. Uh, and maybe you saw on social media regularly, uh, the rock festivals and the music festivals are banned regularly. And the method is really easy because some 
national nationalist or fundamental groups the actual government found and then they wrote a letter wrote a statement against that festival and then the mayor of the city can decide as hey come on maybe this organization can touch down the sensitive points of local values so let's close down or let's postpone so before i finish uh, in this session uh we can uh, point out to some problems about this the interconnections between various actors of public life contribute to the oppression of cultural workers in turkey i can count one of course the government authorities because of the ruling party and the government officials play a significant role in enforcing repressive measures against cultural workers and secondly media not just the free media i'm talking about pro-government media we have too much right now very too to many many newspapers or even the media outlets you can found often engage in some kind of campaigns against cultural workers labeling them as terrorists or traitors easily so one day you can wake up and you can see your uh, image in front page of a newspaper who accused of you traitor uh when I was at the Martin International Martin Biennale, I was the co-creator at that time. After the opening of the <clears throat> uh, Biennale, you know that the regular drinking wine and dine, etc. So uh, <clears throat> after the opening, so in the morning time, we can we saw uh, news that the staff of the Martin Biennale forced the children to drink wine. It's ridiculous, but it was written by the fundamentalist groups. Right now, three of them are members of the parliament under the umbrella of actual government. So, as I told, the method is easy. The nationalist and fundamentalist groups and supporters uh, closely aligned with the government, often target cultural workers who express views challenging the dominant nationalist narrative. And of course, as Sarah and Andrew put rightly, openly and frankly, the censorship apparatus, uh, government institutions, including the media, and also we have, you know that we have another department directly belong to the prime minister, information, sorry, directorate of communications which belongs to Erdogan directly. So actively monitor and censor content across various mediums, limiting freedom and expression and cultural diversity. And lastly, academic institutions, if we can talk about an academy, uh, universities and academic circles face increasing pressure to conform to government policies and restrict critical thinking. So you have to be careful what you say in the class, what you say in a conference, etc. So because some of our professors, some of my colleagues are uh, faced with trials about that because uh, a student or two can uh, do something against you for that. So, uh, and professors and students expressing dissenting views are often punished, leading to self-censorship and a limited exploration of uh, sensitive topics. But uh, before I finish, it is not just problem about the actual government as well. Maybe we can say that last 20 years or 24 years, the actual government put a behavior generally uh, that some private organizations did the same things because they learned that from that kind of one-manship so maybe we can talk another time but you uh, learned uh, i think you uh, saw uh, the news about the last appointment of istanbul by analyst curator so uh, with your permission i can finish right now so i can continue in the second session thank you Thank you. Yes, uh, you touched uh, a lot of important issues like the academic freedom that didn't show up yet uh, so far, but it's also a problem in Poland. You know, I, uh, I myself, I also experienced some 
some problems in censorship at the in the academia. Uh, and also, uh, probably we should mention that uh, there would have been a lot of more cases of prosecution, if not the immigration from Turkey also, because a lot of people managed to escape uh, the, the persecution, right? And among the Turkish and Kurdish uh, um, people. So probably it would have been even worse if, the, if they didn't manage to, to immigrate. But of course, it breaks people's lives uh, because sometimes, of course, they just they, they are refugees, right? And um, and also like you mentioned this way of uh, funding the, the fundamentalists. So this is also like sounds like home because obviously we also have that uh, that the, uh, the the NGOs that prosecute artists are sponsored from the state, and that's why they this is their their uh, way of uh, operating. Um, okay, uh, so then let's uh, let's turn to um, uh, Gergely and uh, to Hungary. And uh, in Hungary, there was um, the new constitution passed in 2010. And so how that did that affect the situation of uh, the freedom of expression in, in Hungary? And what is the MMA? And what does it do to the Hungarian culture? Uh, thank you, Mago Zata, for the question. And thanks, everybody, for being here. And thanks for having me. Um, obviously, the situation in Hungary is not as, as harsh and severe as, as it is in Turkey. But there are some techniques and some methods that the government is using, and, and Firat was talking about, uh, which were really uh, familiar for me as well. And the tendency is really um, kind of um, pointing towards Turkey, pointing towards Russia, or even better, Russia here in Hungary. Um, actually, the new, uh, the new constitution was, was uh, established or introduced in 2011, but, but the, the, the Fidesz government, Fidesz is the name of the ruling party here, uh, started it. It's, it's, uh, it's uh, time in power in 2010 when they won uh, a landslide victory uh, for the first time. And uh, so we are talking about almost 13 years now. Uh, obviously, it was a long and, and difficult and, and um, complex process during the last 10 or so years. So um, I can't go into uh, every single details, but in general, the, the, what happened to the, to the freedom of artistic expression here in Hungary is, is the same what happened with any other freedoms in the country, freedom of press, freedom of media, the political freedom, the workers' rights, etc. Um, a radical and deep legal, a radical and deep uh, reshape of the legal and political and institutional context around all these areas. Um, it was a gradual process, but it happened relatively quickly. Um, if everybody, if, if anybody's interested in the in the little details, I can uh, recommend those two uh, country reports that Margot Jatta just uh, um, talked about uh, during the introduction. One of the reports were uh, was um, published by Artistic Freedom Initiative, a New York-based civil organization, and the title is. Um, systemic suppression. It came out in their series of books named uh, Artistic Freedom Monitor. It came out, I think, two years ago. Uh, it's free to download from the internet, from the website of AFI, Artistic Freedom Initiative. And the other report is a two volume book, which is very interesting, um, put together and published by uh, a Budapest based organization called Network of Academics. Researchers, academics, journalists, teachers, um, scholars came together and uh, put together two booklets about the, the changes on the fields of uh, culture, media, education, and science here in Hungary since 2010. The title of the books, um, Hungary Turns Its Back on Europe, Volume 1, Volume 2, also free to download from the website of OHA. The OHA um, network of academics. Um, I can send you the links if, if anybody is interested. So, um, what happened on the field of art and culture was part of how Fidesz, the ruling party, consolidated its power in all areas in the country um, and in progress in parallel with the restriction of freedom of speech and freedom of press in the country. Um, just very quickly, Fidesz, Fidesz moved from one area to another. First, in 2010, it was press and media, just like in Turkey. Now more, now more than two thirds of the media landscape is controlled 
uh, directly or indirectly by the ruling party, or at least neutral and stay stays close to the ruling party. When I'm talking about party, I'm talking about government. And when I'm talking about government, I'm talking about state because the party, the government and the state obviously strictly uh, and strongly intertwined in this situation. After the press and media, there was the new constitution in 2011 and the new voting legislation, which is even more important than the, than the general constitution, uh, because it was designed to, to ensure that the forthcoming elections after elections will be won by the, by the ruling party now. And then the big chunk, the economy came now According to certain researchers, more than 30% of the whole economy in Hungary is directly or indirectly owned or controlled by the circles of the ruling party. And the latest phenomenon and the latest development is the education, the higher education. Now, there are only five universities remained which are not under the direct control of the party. The all, Every single university were um, privatized in a strange manner. The assets and the organization of the university was transferred, in, was transferred into a big foundation. And the boards of the foundation contains uh, people close to the government circles, close to the ruling parties. It's a very controversial, controversial process. There were several protests and, and everything against it, even the European and Union uh, banned these universities, the privatized universities from the Erasmus and Horizon programs, which is a huge, huge major blow for, for the whole academia in, in Hungary and obviously the, the students. <clears throat> so the same thing happened on the field of arts and culture and the basic uh, characteristics, the basic direction of the the, of the legal and institutional and financial changes are aiming a certain kind of lobotomy or zombification and depoliticization of, of arts and culture here in the country. And at the same time, because we are in the EU, uh, maintaining and keeping up a kind of optical illusion, a kind of uh, optimistic culture production on the surface, but behind the scenes, behind the surface, there is a even stronger um, increasing kind of suppression of critical voices with different tools, obviously self-censorship, encouraging self-censorship is one of the tools. The organization you, uh, Margaret Jata, just asked about, MMA, MMA, stands for um, Hungarian Academy of Arts. It is a big fountainhead, a bigger kind of organization, which is protected by this new um, constitution on the same level as the scientific academy. But at the same time, the, the Academy of Arts is just does not produce any kind of serious output. They don't have any kind of relevant projects. It's nothing more, at least in my opinion, um, than a body of old conservative artists who are paid a monthly salary and whose job is to provide ideological support to the system. This is also one of the tools that the government uses, creating new parallel institutions alongside to the existing ones and downsizing the, the, the old ones and then eliminating them. However, uh, MMI is just becoming less and less important now. This also belongs to the nature of the system to constantly change the inf these informal power centers, placing new institutions, new people, new structures in the center, um, and um, in, in order to create an uncertain kind of um, environment. Why does the government do all this? I think they realize that they do not have to expect any serious political opposition from the parliamentary parties as they are divided and weak. And on the other hand, uh, they uh, identified culture and the cultural civil sector as a potential danger because a kind of criticism and resistance can be formed and, and fostered here. They knew it well, I think, because it's quite the same that it that, that was happened in uh, the 70s and 80s, these little circles of culture, culture production, artistic practices represented a kind of resistance to the system, fostering certain uh, act, kind of political activism as well, and, the, and, the, and then survived the system. <laughs> so this kind of resistance can be small, but it's strong at the same time because it can define the mentality of, of certain circles of the society. Um, I really don't want to go into details because we don't have too much time. Um, as I mentioned, um, 
the, the main characteristic of all these uh, legal and institutional changes are reshaping the environment around culture and art. Um, obviously, in principle, all artists can create works freely and present them freely. But in the main meantime, the institutional environment was radically transform transformed in order to silence the critical voices as much as possible in order to prevent critical works even being produced as much as possible, or if they have been produced, prevent them from having a major impact. What does it mean in the practice? <clears throat> um, control of financial resources, control of mm, spaces of representation, control of media, control of communication channels. The legal context, the institutional con context, as I mentioned, constantly changing. There's an increase in confusion and pressure you never know what's going to happen. Uh, as a result of that, lots of uh, people from the culture field, from the artistic field, leaving the country uh, or staying inactive. There's a kind of fatigue, there's a kind of disillusionment, there's a kind of depression. There's a huge pressure, just like in Turkey, as you mentioned, um, Firat, uh, just some minutes ago, there's a huge pressure on the existential individual level on everybody. The increasing uh, high inflation, which is actually the highest in the European Union, obviously doesn't help. So even buying the basic food stuff for the people is just quite quite a big quite a big challenge for for almost everybody here in the country. Up until the recent times, and that's the last thing I would like to mention, there was no direct censorship cases because the government just didn't need it because they reshaped the whole system. And as I mentioned, the critical works quite quite a lot of good critical work just just invisible for the for the for for most of the people but recently under the pretext of protecting the minors protecting the children a new law um came up uh, which attempts to restrict the public's exposure to lgbtq issues and themes in educational institutions and media and there's a increasing criminalization of transmission of LGBTQ uh, content. And as a result, the, uh, the bu book publishers have to um, wrap certain books in foil, which is quite ridiculous in a way. But from this time on, we have to live together with, with these, these books in the bookstores, which is quite kind of, you know, frightening and bizarre and, and um, strange at the same time so this is i think this is a serious step towards the the direct censorship after the the subtle um, techniques here in hungary yes thank you um yes it's uh, it's very important what you said also that the that the, the governments are afraid of us because this is where the criticism comes from and um yes and then the that we are we were really uh walking also this into this direction that we stopped needing uh the censorship and it was actually the we, we were uh, already on that path i think uh, because when i was reporting the cases of censorship in poland up to 21 it, it was a lot of it but all of a sudden it stopped and there was like um almost nothing to talk about because uh, they changed the directors of institutions and then uh, people are self censoring themselves and that's it yeah and so we just don't have any opposition we okay in poland our situation is, is different because we have um it's the, the system is a little bit decentralized yes yeah? so so uh it's a little bit better but still uh, this is very very uh, sad what you are talking about um so so um let's switch to because we are going to continue talking about hunger of course uh, later but let's switch to um to yakub uh because uh, yakub wrote that um famous book on censorship uh, and is also an active observer of public life uh, but also in your recent text uh, well, not so recent but the last one about censorship in Shum you wrote that uh, maybe it's not time to lament, lament the censorship of, of the visual arts when the forests burn and then it was both meant as the climate catastrophe but also the total destruction of democracy uh, in Poland so if you could tell us um, uh, how the situation changed uh, since after the, the period that was covered by your book, uh, that means after 2010. Okay, thank you for the invitation. Hello, everyone. Um, well, when I while I was writing, I while uh, writing about uh, 
forest issue. Yeah, I had in mind even broader broader context. It seems that uh, democratic systems globally um, are under pressure and um, heading towards kind of catastrophe. It's not only about Poland, Hungary, Turkey, uh, Israel, or India. But let's look at the United States and uh, the attack on the capital and the growing politicization politicization of this. Uh, of the society, um, and uh, let's look at the growing power of the nationalist uh, populist uh, uh, parties in Germany or France, yeah, or Slovakia, which actually they, they just took power in this country. Um, no, do not forget about Russia, which is actually a pure totalitarianism combined with uh, very aggressive imperialism now. So the situation as a whole in the world is, I would say, uh, very, uh, very dangerous. Um, if we, if we uh, speak from the position of, of liberal democracy, but turning specifically to to Poland, um, no doubt since the election uh, in 2015, um, in Poland the situation uh, gradually abandoned. Uh, I mean, Poland gradually abandoned uh, the established rules of liberal democracy and uh, law and justice that's the name of the ruling party um, uh, let's stress the, the party still uh, still have uh, still has the the power and tries to secure this power for the future and um, um, uh, stand against such uh, such uh, values uh, against uh, values such as a balance between different types of powers, separation of state and church, quality of legislation, human and civil rights protection, especially women rights, uh, women reproductive rights and LGBTQ rights, uh, pluralistic mass media, and delegation of powers to lower levels. However, the above mentioned, um, mentioned foundations of liberal democracy didn't function well in Poland and were already corrupted before before law and justice came to power in 2015. I mean, especially a conservative, um, conservative composition and rulings of Polish constitutional court. Also, uh, discrimination of sexual minorities and women, uh, omnipresent of the Catholic Church in, in, in social and politi uh, political life, and instability um, of legislation, chaotic, very chaotic legislation. So this issue have um, also influenced the freedom of art in Poland ever since and in my opinion the the current situation uh, current uh, state of affairs is just a hyper intensification of the problems of, of problems which were gradually accumulated in poland after 1989 so so what is this um, uh, hyper uh, intensification about uh, currently um uh, reaching uh, for the well-known Althusserian terms uh law and justice has started to use the repressive state apparatus and the cultural state apparatuses in a very peculiar way at the beginning law and justice law and justice did not use the police did not use the police and the prosecutor's office uh, very often and concentrated concentrated efforts on hegemonic policy executed through ideological state apparatus, especially legal, educational on every level, um, uh, uh, church, I mean religion, and uh, um, uh, information policy, and of course, uh, uh, cultural field. So um, to illustrate the following uh, actions uh, have been taken uh, by the authorities in the domain of culture to, to enforce the role of the cultural ideological state apparatus. Uh, the role of the central government was, uh, has been strengthened. Uh, new institutions have been established or new programs and staff have been introduced to the old ones. Um, most of the management in cultural institutions has been replaced and the distribution of money uh, to institutions, trade press artists and uh, scholars has been brought under strict control. And it's important to note that the, the, the changes in the cultural field, uh, in the cultural ideological state uh, apparatus, um, have been carried out in very uh, very planned manner. That the party first took control over uh, over the sector with the strongest social impact. That means, of course, mass media, 
and the film industry. Uh, after that, they began to, to pacify the theater milieu, uh, gradually changing the management of, uh, uh, of the institutions um, uh, and promoting, they started to promote institutions with conservative programs. They, cut, they also cut budgets of the progressive uh, festivals and theaters. Um, at the same time, law and justice started to develop their own institutions um, vital for the newly declared uh, history-oriented policy, which is actually the main point of their cultural agenda, history-oriented policy, which is uh, pointed toward, um, toward uh, I mean, they want to build one-dimensional uh, uh, national proud uh, community yeah, via this kind of institution, this kind of uh, uh, policy. And um, uh, so, in general, law and justice um, subverted the, the principle of the autonomy of the, the cultural field. Um, the authorities are not to support artists or, uh, or cultural institutions any longer, but to set the activities in accordance, um, um, in accordance with the preferred ideology. The politicians claim that they represent the like, sovereign's will and it puts them into position, uh, um, in position to make demands on the artists. And let's emphasize that, uh, emphasize that in general, visual arts have not played an important role um, in this uh, cultural policy. The Minister of Culture and National Heritage, uh, Piotr Gliński, rather moderately introduced changes uh, in the field of visual arts uh, in comparison to other uh, uh, other uh, areas of culture. Uh, I believe this specific leniency um, can be attributed to two factors. Uh, the limited social influence of art, uh, uh, visual arts, and secondly, um, significant lack of right-wing conservative uh, professionals. However, Minister Glinski couldn't entirely neglect this, uh, this area of, of culture, of course. And um, he finally took steps corresponding to those in the other areas of culture, uh, which I already mentioned. Um, undoubtedly, any political pressure negatively uh, influences all art institutions and induces self-censorship. And even the liberal management that is uh, controlled by local governments, which are in opposition to the, the, the main government, central government, um, has started to censor exhibition because they, they are afraid of, of uh, some legal actions or financial uh, uh, sanctions. And uh, although the political tension is strong, because, I mean, maybe it was, but still it is, in fact, yeah? um, and the government uh, interferes in many fields of, uh, of social and political life, um, so far, law and justice um, wasn't able to fully silence the, the resistance, the opposition, and seal the hegemonic system as probably, uh, that's what happened probably in, in Turkey or, or Hungary. And uh, the civic society remains pretty strong in Poland. Um, and part of the mass media still remains independent. It's very, very uh, important. So basic democratic institutions and mechanism of the weekend uh, remain uh, continue to function, uh, continue to function, and the Catholic religion is not so strong as it was 30 years ago, uh, especially among young people, people under 30. And um, mm, uh, currently, there are, uh, uh, I mean, uh, that is why the need uh, to use the repressive state apparatus, apparatus, uh, apparatus sorry. Uh, especially police and um, prosecution office uh, became more appealing. So currently there are a couple of ongoing criminal proceedings against visual artists and many more uh, cases against activists who employ in their activity uh, visual culture or, or strategies of uh, visual arts. And uh, these precise uh, uh, actions um, by the authorities and the uh, prosecutor's office are above all a, a part of party propaganda. They convey a message to the hard-headed staunch supporters um, that um, um, we are fighting for the values you cherish, yeah? and something like that. Or we are battling against uh, left is the European Union and the Kelty agenda. Yeah, the, the, the kind of very specific rhetoric uh, behind these actions. And um, 
um, also, um, I would say simultaneously, uh, the actions of the repressive apparatus serve uh, as a, a message to the opposition. Do not go this way. Yeah? Uh, do not follow this path. So the, the signal is intended to induce a so-called freezing effect, which amounts, of course, to the self to self censorship, which is, of course, the most uh, dangerous uh, dangerous uh, form of, of censorship, uh, especially it refers to the people who who are trying to to challenge the ruling party. And um, I would like to also I would like to ask also whether this censorship pressure. Um, contributed to the electoral um, defeat of law uh, and justice. And to be honest, I, I'm not sure, I'm not entirely sure. Um, if we define the culture in this broad sense, we might, we might say yes. Uh, I think, I'm, I'm thinking now about this dual uh, propaganda and harsh censorship in public media, which, are, uh, which is in fact party media, it's not public at all. It's called now national media, but this is law and justice media. And this um, this uh, really dull propaganda and and censorship was really irritating. It was really um, something embarrassing, even for many people on the right uh, side of the political scene, even for the people who primarily supported law and justice. Uh, so um, um, undoubtedly. Uh, uh, it um, stimulated the kind of uh, kind of uh, resistance towards the, it, it was very similar to the communist time and very similar I'm, I'm talking about the, the, the propaganda and on the other hand the, the, the problems of the sector of the high culture uh, was somehow downplayed I mean um, uh, it was lost amid uh, numerous scandals, political and social tensions, and other heavy, uh, heavy weight um, controversies. Um, I think I'm, I'm done, thank you. Thank you. We're going to continue later. Yes, and also what um, you mentioned, uh, that was very important, I think that uh, on the on the, uh, on the right wing side, there is not many competent uh, people, and this was actually this is this is a very uh, serious uh, issue now, um, because obviously when Learn Justice uh, changed that they removed the, the previous directors and and put their on their nominates, then uh, not only they are ideologically on their side, but they're also um, amateurs basically yeah. in that job. Yes, yeah? so this is this can cause a disaster, and this uh, already caused some. <laughs> disasters sure, sure. Um, so um yes and then um uh let's move on i'd like to only uh, also like underline this uh, um, this uh, under the radar uh, elements uh, of the um, of, of censorship that uh, all the directors of art institutions in our countries usually know how long their leash is even if they try to uh, still keep uh, working and keep showing experimental and alternative stuff, then they really uh, know uh, how far they can go. And, and this is also, this creates this toxic relationship because uh, it is the, the relationship between the manager of the gallery uh, and the authorities, but also between the institution and artists. And it creates this hostility um, among those groups. And this is also... Um, you know, this creates this lack of trust, and, and this is also pretty dangerous. And um, uh, this also comes with the economic censorship that we talk about it, but it's very, and it was interesting because at least in Poland for some time, it was very difficult to prove. I was trying to find some tools to prove it because uh, of course it exists and you can see it, but uh, how you can really prove it that the project wasn't funded because of ideological reasons. But slowly we reach the point where you don't even have to have the any tools because it's obvious. Uh, because if it doesn't have national in the title, it's not going to get funding. Uh, don't pull the second, yeah. You need to have John exactly. The title of the <laughs> yeah, you you will get the grant for sure. Yeah. Yes. So so this was um, this is uh, one of the issues also, and this the status of the artist because that that came um, uh, into light like uh, when there is this last um, interview with uh, Glinski in the in the media when he talks about the 
the we, we were supposed to have that bill uh, the of the status of the artist right so that for the yeah. social um, sec uh, security for the artists and it didn't go through so the artists don't have any kind of like if they are not hired by some company or a, a academy yeah. or whatever they don't have any uh, social security and this was supposed to be um, uh, uh, voted voted through, but it didn't. And he said explicitly that he is not going to be able to explain to the voters, to his electorate, that he is doing this for Yanda, for Kristina Yanda or Andrei Severin, you know, the, the actors. And so that means that shows this kind of disrespect to uh, to artists that are not really on their. Uh, side and this is also um, very uh, dangerous because that goes that the example goes from above and then it, it translates to how people how the society treats artists in general um, and um, and also I think that there's this lack of diversity in the decision making bodies so this is also some something that is very subtle but it exists yeah um, all right uh, so let's move on uh, to maybe more a little bit more positive uh, <laughs> note so i'd like to come back to andrew and uh, because you, you mentioned this uh, um, resistance in in japan uh, especially on the on the occasion of Aichichi now, but maybe there's uh, some others that how uh, art, the public and artists uh, reacted after for, for, to the censorship uh, because they reacted in a very creative way, and maybe there are other ways of resistance that um, you are familiar with. Yeah, I mean, I think with the Aichichi in LA, uh, one of the fascinating things about the response was that it was not quite coordinated you know it was actually really uh kind of spontaneous and i wouldn't say fractured but there were a lot of different channels through which it was taking place so for example the organizers of this uh display dealing with works that had previously been removed from exhibitions are sort of an older generation they were connected into the old guard uh, sort of student movement scene and and so they were able to work with their networks but uh, younger artists in the exhibition also put together uh, their own platform called uh, Refreedom Aichi. And I was involved in that as a volunteer advisor and translator. And uh, they organized a kind of pressure campaign, uh, both uh, working with the uh, Triennale staff and also working with the public to, to sort of raise awareness of the issue. They were also a group of international artists and one Japanese artist who uh, removed their works from exhibition. And, and initially it, it seemed like they were going to actually withdraw the works from exhibition. They later, or, or sort of in the process, they reframed it as a pause. Um, and so they, they said they would uh, put their works back on view once the um, other display was reinstated. Um, so, you know, I think, in a sense, if if everyone involved in the Triennale had just said, we're going to withdraw our works un until um, the display is reinstated, it would have probably just been the end of the exhibition. Uh, but I think having all these different um, sort of parallel uh, actors actually ended up um, creating a sort of a zone of uh, where, where, you know, people could meet in the middle. Uh, and, and so the governor of Aichi, who was also uh, technically the head of the Triennale, uh, in, instituted um, a kind of review panel to, to look into how the controversy originated and, and assess whether the display should be reinstated. Um, obviously, you know, we want our institutions to stand strong for artistic freedom when there is outside pressure uh, from from the government or from other actors, uh, and and it's not always um, possible. Or in the case of Aichi, it happened so quickly, you know, that I think uh, the Triennale organizers were actually cut off guard a bit. You know, so I think the important thing is that although everyone started off on the back foot initially, we were able to you know work toward establishing. Um, a sort of 
more of a consensus zone where we could, you know, really uh, appeal to a lot of people to reinstate the uh, the display. Um, I know we were, and, and actually, uh, you know, since uh, the IT Triennale or in the wake of the IT Triennale, there have been artists who have formed groups, uh, artists and art workers who have formed groups to look into um, issues of harassment in, in uh, the cultural sector, uh, like sexual harassment and power harassment. Uh, there have been various artist unions that have formed uh, to, to sort of support each other and, and um, both economically and in terms of uh, kind of restoring a balance with institutions in terms of this sort of uh, precarious uh, work status that Sarah mentioned in her presentation. Um, but actually, you know, I think there's also another ongoing case uh, that's been developing over the past two years of, an, of another artist called Yuki Iyama, uh, who was doing a, a show at a sort of a somewhat irregular artist space called the Tokyo Metropolitan Human Rights Plaza. Uh, so, you know, this is a, a kind of a facility that was had started to organize exhibitions for uh, artists on a smaller, contemporary artists on a smaller scale. And uh, as part of her solo exhibition, she wanted to organize a screening of a work she had made that dealt with the massacre, the historic massacre of Koreans in Japan uh, immediately after the 1923 Great Kanto earthquake that devastated uh, Tokyo and, and the Yokohama area. Uh, and this work was not actually included in the exhibition proper. She wanted to organize a special screening for it, and the screening was canceled uh, by the by the uh, sort of by again. It's it's a little unclear who the actors were, but it was it was kind of canceled through um, the uh, the leadership of of this venue, which is directly uh, supervised by the Tokyo Metropolitan Government. Um, and in her case, uh, she has been active in campaigning uh, and kind of getting her story out in the open, getting uh, media to report on her story, holding press conferences and protest actions uh, to raise awareness of what happened. Um, but I think in contrast to the IG Triennale, which was a very high profile event, uh, this was sort of already a kind of non-mainstream art space and and there's confusion about what happened or who's responsible and so um you know she hasn't been able to garner the same amount of uh, of support that 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 uh, took place in the case of IG um so i think there's still um a lot to be desired uh, in terms of of how people respond uh, to in you know incursions on freedom um, and how you know the how effective the media or other channels can be in 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 pushing back uh, against uh, these uh, suppressions of of artistic freedom. Um, but I just want to say though that at one point during the IT Triennale controversy, the Agency for Cultural Affairs, which was one of the main uh, supporters of the event, uh, said it would withdraw the grant that it had um, promised to the Triennale. And then several months after the uh, closure of the exhibition, it restored uh, a significant amount of the grant, I think almost like 80% or, or so of the grant. Uh, and, and so the missing amount was sort of a penalty for what happened uh, with, with the controversy. Um, and again, you know, it's sort of, not the ideal outcome, uh, but it's still, I think, significant that the agency did restore a substantial amount of the grant. Um, you know, so I think there are all these sort of uh, gray zones uh, that that are that we have to navigate in Japan, um, and and I think a lot of times, you know. I, it, people have to feel their way through as it's happening, but more organization of, of artists and, and cultural workers is one way to, I guess, create a sort of positive foundation to build on. 
Okay. Uh -huh. Thank you. I, I particularly like the 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 ways the artists reacted. Like that, I don't remember the name of the artist who like um, wrapped uh, his or her work into a newspaper. Yes. Yeah. The, there was a Cuban was... artist who was in the IT tree in LA. Yeah. yeah. Yes. So uh, yes, it was interesting that you what you said that the, also like uh, sometimes uh, removing works is not uh, the the best solution. That you just have to have the the foot in the door. Um, okay. So uh, Firat, um, we know that uh, of course uh, you talked about the consequences and that are very harsh. And so, uh, but I always found it inspirational when when we talk about the uh, culture and the cultural life with uh, the people from Turkey because you, all of you are very very courageous and there are still the organizations such as Depo and Anadolu Kultur and others and. Um, other uh, artists and curators resist and keep uh, doing uh, things, even though they risk all these consequences that you talked about earlier. So can you give us the, some examples of the activities that uh, cultural workers undertake to show their non-compliance with the governmental policy? Yeah, 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 sure, sure. We <clears throat> uh, don't want to lose the hope. So uh, there are numerous examples of cultural workers in Turkey that engage in activities uh, to show their non-compliance with the government policies, of course. So for instance, it's not about directly art, but you know that we lost the Hassan Cave. It's a very important archeological site in the, um uh, southeastern part of turkey because of their uh, the actual government did do a dam project uh, the ancient city of hasan cave was set to be flooded uh, but cultural workers including activists artists and academics joined forces to form the hasan caves action group and then they organized protests raised awareness through various mediums and engaged in uh some legal uh fightings to protect the cultural heritage of that area uh, area and recently also we faced with the same ecological problems uh, we have a forest uh, akbelan in the city of mula uh, and the akbelan forests as uh, to all the artists and activists some artists and activists did try to gather to uh, fight against this uh, ecological uh, problems about the um, coal mining problems. But the strange thing is that maybe it's not strange. Uh, the owner of the company who did this ecological disaster to the area uh, is the main supporter of Saha Group, who supported the contemporary art directly in Turkey. And also another funny thing is that she includes the membership of the World uh, Protect Foundation. It's really ridiculous sometimes to hear these kind of things. Anyway, uh, we did try to this kind of uh, fight against the government. And, and another uh, good thing is that we have some biannales. Uh, other than Istanbul Biennale. Istanbul Biennale is in the uh, maybe uh, the most 10 lists uh, anyway, but we have another uh, local uh, and international Biennale, such as in the city of Mardin in the Kurdish side of Turkey and Sinopale in the middle of the Black Sea region. And recently the Mediterranean Biennale we have in the city of uh, Tarsus in the Kilikia region and also the Hellespontos Biennale, the Çanakkale Biennale. This kind of event uh, is really useful to make awareness of these kind of sensitive issues in an artistic way. And, and also freedom of expression initiative we have. So various cultural workers and organizations, including artists, writers, and journalists have united under the freedom of expression initiative to support and defend freedom of speech in Turkey. And they organize events, exhibitions, and campaigns that advocate for artistic and intellectual freedom. And also, uh, 
gradual living lost our effect maybe in the academies but once uh, the solidarity with academics for peace case we uh, confronted maybe you remember after a petition calling for peace in the kurdish majority areas of turkey was signed by thousands of academics but many signatories faced persecution and dismissal from their positions but the on the second wave uh, we did established the solidarity with academics for peace emerged as a support network for these academics uh, while with cultural workers joining in solidarity through exhibitions performances and public statements and also the actual governments don't like uh, the uh, cartoons the humor so uh, satire has always played a significant role in turkey's cultural landscape even before this government. But despite increasing restrictions of freedom of expression, many cartoonists use their ability to criticize and satirize the government's policies. So publications like Penguin, Lehman, and Uykusuz have continued to feature political cartoons and illustrations. And also, of course, we have a uh, we have a great opportunity to do our exhibitions. So in these exhibitions, uh, we organize that and address social and uh, political issues in Turkey. Um, often we did try to tackle subjects that are considered sensitive and controversial by the government as well. Um, we uh, continue to do that. And also we have some important film screenings and festivals. So also these events play a crucial role in showcasing alternative narratives and dissenting voices. But recently also we did leave some problems about some movies uh, in the shortlist. So for instance, recently the Antalya Film Festival uh, had to be postponed uh, by the municipality. Strange thing is that municipality is in the opposite party. Uh, and cultural festivals and events, more or less, we did try to, we, we are trying to continue, with, such as Istanbul Theater Festival or documentaries, the documentary film festival. So in that festivals, uh, they aim to create space where artists can freely express their views and engage with audiences, despite potential repercussions. Uh, repair uh, question sorry and of course we have some publications uh, newspapers uh, and some art magazines so as cultural workers uh, we continue to publish critical articles and books that question the government's policies and advocate for human rights and freedom of expression some independent publishing houses we have so they provide us platforms for uh, express our ideas and promote uh, our thoughts against uh, the government. Uh, online platforms and social media, the actual governments are very sensitive on that, you know that. Uh, but given the restrictions on traditional media, because I told, so actual governments did create a pro media too much uh, so we have turned to online platforms and social media sometimes to share our work and express our content uh, so we so you can find many uh, accounts on twitter and instagram and youtube as well uh, According to the Constitution, there is no need to take a permission if you want to do some demonstrations and protests. But actual government did use this uh, law uh, in a wrong way. But uh, we continue to participate in public demonstrations and protests as well, both independently or in collaboration with some uh, activist groups as well. So, uh, as I told, uh, no need to uh, lose our hope. So we 
have to continue to struggle um, in Turkey uh, for that. Thank you. Thank you. And if there is anything we can do uh, for Turkey, let us know, uh, because obviously um, we are on your side. You are not walking alone. Um, just a small technical yeah. thing, like if uh, anybody would like to ask, like everybody from our participants would like to uh, ask any question, then it's going to be possible after. So you can either speak up or uh, you can write it on the chat, uh, however, uh, which way you prefer. Okay, so um, Gerge, um, when we um, had our controvers controversial change in the National Gallery Zahenta in Warsaw, um, and it's, you know, like the, the director now is like a disaster uh, painter, some people then were uh, considering the occupation of the National Gallery, uh, and it was basing on the experience of the Occupy Ludwig movement. And uh, finally, no one took it up because it was winter and it was like a Christmas and New Year's Eve uh, period and they were afraid that it's not going to be effective. But so could you please tell me about any initiatives um, against the, the policy of Orban and uh, also, of course, I mean, the, of Biennale? Thank you. Yeah, actually, there are quite a few. Um, and I think this is a pretty important part of the discussion because we are talking about the the infrastructure of dissent here as as it was called by sociologist Alan Sears I, I particularly like this expression because it it somehow um, emphasizes its, its importance and also the position and also the fragility of uh, of these uh, kind of uh, structures um, obviously, the picture is not that black and white in Hungary, as it might seem. There are still small institutions, grassroots initiatives that mostly remain invisible for the government, for the authorities, and therefore untouched as well, more or less. <clears throat> and there are obviously cities under opposition leadership, like Budapest, the capital. It's very important because these cities, smaller and bigger cities, still can maintain their their arts and culture institutions uh, relatively in an autonomous position even though the government is constantly constantly uh, absorbing their resources and sucking the air away from from these cities uh, budapest is an interesting example because it's a relatively big city for for a small country so 2 million inhabitants in a in a country of 10 million so so lots of uh, critical artistic practices uh, small institutions, small venues, little theaters, little galleries, artisan spaces, etc., are concentrated in in Budapest, and that's very important. But at the same time, it also means that it's kind of a bubble. Uh, the, the the audience here, the circumstances here, are pretty much different than from uh, elsewhere in the country. And as I said, the government does everything to 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 make it impossible to to maintain this infrastructure and to finance this in infrastructure. So virtually, these places just don't have any access to 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 state uh, funding or public funding distributed by the states anymore. What is interesting um, is that almost from the first minute after 2010, a kind of artistic resistance developed here in the country. Uh, at least uh, in the visual arts scene, which is quite interesting because we don't really have this kind of uh, political activist art tradition in the Hungarian uh, history of art. So a new kind of a new wave of, uh, of political consciousness and, and activism just emerged after 2010. And the contemporary art scene was pretty much the first to, to step up against the oppression. Uh, it was the most vocal and most active at that time uh, between 2011 and 2015 16. Um, perhaps because this area was among the first ones that the government tried to reshape and tried out different techniques here in this scene. Um, that particular uh, building of occupation you referred to. It, it took place in 2013 at the Ludwig Museum in Budapest after a, a very controversial change of management. And the protesters, artists, curators, students, activists, um, occupied the building for almost two weeks. It was 10, 11 days or so. Um, and and they, in the first place, they demanded transparency and professional decision-making, uh, which describes the situation then. 
uh, and rather reflects on the question of, of, of losing our institutions, that losing the institutions, reshaping the institutional landscape, as I mentioned, it was one of the first steps that the government did in order to reshape the whole environment around the artistic practices. Quite typically at that time, uh, this was even hit the, the evening news in the state-run television channel, which is totally unthinkable um, uh, these days. There are thousands of people out on the streets, demonstrations always, always uh, almost, almost every day, uh, and, um, and the state-run media just, just stays in silence these days. That time it was really different. Uh, it was a pretty, pretty, pretty different period in this sense as well. Um, <clears throat> that occupation was, so to say, the, one of the highest points of this artistic resistance at that time. However, within a few years, these protests uh, and protest strategies were exhausted and suffocated and a kind of uh, fatigue uh, um, <clears throat> uh, occurred in the, in the circles of the contemporary art scene. And a new kind of demand arose that instead of protesting, or in addition to protesting, we should start building up new structures. We should uh, create something. And it was quite obvious that this only can happen if we leave the government controlled area, leave the trap that they have set up for us, um, open a new perspective and start building something outside of the existing structures. And that is exactly what Of Biennial, uh, the organization you mentioned, um, uh, attempted to do. This is a small civil organization. You, you might have heard of, of Biennial because it became quite a big story uh, here in the region and maybe not only in the region. Uh, what the people who, who started this small organization uh, attempted is bringing together the stakeholders of the contemporary art scene, artists, curators, gallery, even gallerists, commercial galleries, organizers, culture practitioners, even journalists like me, uh, collectors, and making new alliances and putting together something uh, on a on a joint basis on a on a on a unified basis putting together a small organization that is constantly changing trying to adapt to the ever changing circumstances and producing something visible um, this came to life in the shape of uh, of an international contemporary art biennial of biennial uh, in 2015 that was the first edition um, off as an organization and as a series of events does not apply for any state funding in Hungary and does not use the state-run culture infra infrastructure. It, it is using off spaces like apartments, empty shops, uh, industrial facilities, empty spaces, uh, even public uh, spaces in the city or outskirts of the city as well. Off became a success. It had three editions so far. Uh, the biennial format is also pretty interesting. I don't think I have the time to, to, to go into the details. Um, this was an interesting choice to, to create an international event be because um, of biennial, the people of, of biennial just recognized that there's an increasing um, isolation uh, as a result of the, of, the, of the government measures and the government policies here in the art scene. So we are getting more and more um, distant in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an ever growing distance from the international art community. And they wanted to, to, to show and wanted to do something bigger, something that is more visible for the inter international scene as well. But what is uh, important here that after a few years of Biennial not only offered an interface an exhibition opportunity, but also started to act as producer and help to create works. Because as I mentioned in the first round, uh, the main um, result of the government policies were that certain uh, artistic practices became impossible. And you couldn't, you when you needed funding, when you needed institutional background, when you needed research partners, etc., you just could not do your um, artwork. Well, what you could do on the kitchen table, that was quite, quite okay and quite easy, but when you wanted to work on a, on a different scale, it was it, it became um, impossible. When we're talking about of biennial, we also have to mention another really great example, at least in my opinion, it's a shiny example of, of what can we do in a situation like that. And it's free SFA, which is an education organization. SFA is um, the University of uh, Theater and Film, which is a small university here in Budapest. And as I mentioned, the government started a violent and fast 
aggressive privatization process on the field of the higher education. And uh, SFA, this tiny little university in 2020, was the only one that resisted uh, to this violent process. The, the students and some of the, uh, of the teachers um, occupied the university buildings here in Budapest and had the blockade for more than 70 days. And only the COVID forced them out from the building. And after um, leaving the building, most of the students and the teachers decided to leave the university administratively and starting a new organization from scratch, a virtually a kind of um, invisible university or virtual university, so to say. Um, they started this new organization that was called Free SFM, uh, which is kind of a free university, of course, never got the official accreditation. But it is keeping the tradition of the original university alive, still very active, still still working. And what's more, uh, at Free SFA, this tiny little organization could take it to another level. They have decided to create a new platform, and that's really interesting here, in alliance with five or six, I think six other universities in Europe, um, they formed an international project called Emergency Exit. Um, and the students of Free SFA are awarded degrees, diplomas by these foreign universities. So they are studying here and they get their diplomas elsewhere. I think this is a very smart kind of construction and a very, very um, uh, smart way of operation. Uh, and also an, an example for, for survival, for, for a way out of this kind of trap that was set for us, set up for us. Um, it's an organization without a center, without a hierarchy, so it cannot be beheaded. It, uh, it is translocal, transborder, if you like. It's a corporation, so if it's attacked here in Budapest, there are still uh, opportunities uh, to carry on, and there are still other centers that this organization can carry on. Uh, still, there's a network that can keep up the, the activities and the, and the educational processes. And I think it's 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 a quite uh, remarkable and interesting uh, example of how to how to create something um, that serves as a safe haven for for people, and at the same time, um, it, also it is effective and 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 takes the problem and takes the solution as well, or on an international level, of course. And that's maybe the last point here for me. Uh, the big question here uh, regarding this example is sustainability. And therefore, it would be very useful if big organizations and big funders, big funds, even the European Union could uh, properly identify these uh, initiatives, these structures, uh, and could provide direct financial contributions to them. Uh, culture is, is in the national competence in the, in the European Union. That's, that's one of the problems. Uh, that's, that's what the Orban government is using because the European Union just does not have a word how they distribute uh, public funding for the culture. Um, that it would be nice to to sort of channeling direct direct fun, uh, financial help to these to these organizations which keep up the spirit here in this country and maybe maybe there are um, same examples elsewhere. Okay, thank you. Yes, this is very impressive. Uh, I don't think the this is a very unique. I think the the example of the academia, yeah, of the academic world, the self organization, because this is really, really um, courageous uh, move. Yeah. And uh, yeah, and everywhere else, I think like uh, we resist, but silently, I think more than uh, openly. Uh, they, were, they, they were vocal. They were very, very strong, and they organized big, big demonstrations. I mean, the the students of uh, Academy of Film and Theater, because you know they they are dealing with uh, with with theater and films. So so they were very smart in organizing these huge uh, mass demonstrations. Obviously, the pro uh, privatization process occurred and it, it went on, so they could not uh, break it. But they they could start a new page. They they could they could leave the trap. They could leave out. They could flip the script if you like and start something new and and i think that's remarkable here sorry for, mm -hmm. for yes yeah, yeah yeah and also and also like the i think the way forward is also creating like the safe space for alternative art uh, and just taking things in our hands but this is of course very difficult because like you said without funding and without the sustainable funding this is really 
uh, really hard because we just uh, uh, all of us just keep struggling um, all the time. And then, okay, um, great. So let's move on to Poland then, uh, because in Poland uh, we had quite a, uh, some smaller and bigger events, uh, and uh, the bigger, the most famous one was the banana gate <laughs> the banana action against the censoring of Natalia LL consumption art. But then soon uh, it was uh, it was removed. It was the whole exhibit was um, brought back the, the artwork. But then it was the whole exhibition was uh, closed for renovation anyway. So uh, so it didn't work for long. And so how do you think how the Polish art community um, reacted uh, to the situation? Uh, and then were we doing enough? And maybe also some comments on the future, like what we should do now with the, our uh, culture um, situation. I think that um, um, we reacted poorly. Uh, we didn't. Uh, we didn't do enough uh, um, to combat the censorship and the kind of injustice and uh, corruption within the field of culture. But I'd like to to justify justify somehow myself and ourselves. I mean, it was really really hard, really challenging, because law and justice played in a very specific manner. Uh, implementing a kind of creeping, uh, uh, creeping, uh, um, uh, creeping revolution, conservative revolution. So, um, um, uh, and what what's important? They they did it with with the support of uh, majority of voters. I mean, it's really important to to uh, stress that they won two consecutive uh, two consecutive um, elections. So it wasn't just, you know, like a, a kind of uh, a authoritarian system imposed from some some somewhere. Yeah, it was actually the decision of our our society. But um, um, over long, very long uh, eight years, uh, they seldom undertook um, spectacular, large-scale, violent actions. Employing rather um, a, a strategy of small steps, um, and it was like uh, let's take control over this institution, and then that institution, and the next institution, and they do it very slowly and gradually, and we are done with it. So okay, we are done with it. So let's start to change the, the management. Let's fire this curator. Let's change the director. So it wasn't you know like like a huge punch. Uh, uh, against our uh, our community, but with like lots of small steps uh, which were carried out over over almost eight years, and um, um, mm, all this made it really difficult to mobilize mobilize our our community to to uh, resist this kind of. Uh, crawling a uh, creeping uh, oppression and um actually we weren't uh, united enough and we didn't play together and it refers also to the whole of our society i mean um uh, i have to admit like probably many others I was uh, um, I was in dark despair. I was like uh, something like, uh, "Oh come on, uh, we have to survive somehow this madness." And the Polish society can't be so stupid, so naive. So it will change soon, I am sure. So it took us eight years, but we won finally. But um, talking about the society, it, I think it was really important. I mean. For instance, young people, they were not interested in supporting um, an independent legal system, for instance. They didn't care about a judiciary system, a fair ju judiciary system at all. Some members of our community, uh, I can say that they did it the same. They treated the, the, this kind of system as a, one of the pillars of the conservative country, not as a, as a pillar of any democratic system. Yeah? So it was a, a problem. Um, uh, for instance, uh, the academicians, uh, Polish academicians, were divided. Were, were divided, and actually, they um, um, uh, um, they fight each other of a of, of a very controversial reform of the higher educational system. 
so uh, higher education system. So they weren't united to the prosecutors, uh, Polish prosecutors were totally intimidated by the Ministry of Justice, uh, Polish, uh, um, uh, Polish uh, judges. They, they resisted at the beginning, bravely resisted at the beginning. But, you know, after a couple of years, they started to give up. Like it was this kind of neoliberal mantra. OK, everyone has a mortgage and everyone has a family to support. So we need to 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 go on with this this uh, I need to censor myself here yeah, now uh, and um, what else um, so the only the only point which is really important uh, during over the last eight years was actually uh, the autumn of, autumn of 2020 when the uh, all nation women's tribe broke out. And actually, it was against uh, 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 against the ban imposed on abortion in Poland, um, and it united lots of different communities, uh, different uh, groups uh, of different ages, uh, 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 different uh, ideological preferences, and was really important. It was like first scratch on the monolith of of the power, or even maybe a kind of crack. And people started to believe that it it, it would change. So um, uh, this this kind of um, unity, this kind of um, um, empowerment, which uh, uh, occurred in that time in in autumn 2020, was really important. And you know, the 75 percent uh, uh, voter turnout um, two weeks ago. Uh, in my opinion, I had played pivotal role, pivotal role uh, in the election uh, in the election outcome. It was so. In my opinion, I mean, we as a as a small uh, as a small group as a small community as art, uh, we, we weren't so important as a as thinking in the more holistic way, uh, as thinking about the whole society, yeah? and uh, we won as a society and. But that's the point of my uh, my talk now. Thank you. Thank you. But um, well, yes, uh, I think I also agree that the, the protests of 2020 uh, were really crucial because um, I remember then what well, the anti anti ban anti abortion ban uh, protests were not nothing new because the, we had uh, we've been protesting since 2017. But I remember that, or 16 even, uh, but I remember that, for example, when I was working in the academia, the students were not interested in it. So like the, all the teachers were going to protest, but, yeah. but the students were like saying like, what protest? But then in 2020, I think, I think also pandemic helped us because yeah. people were locked in, in, in their houses and they just wanted to go out and they just were looking for a pretext to go out. And uh, and yes, it was really massive. No, but also, lots of students were in the in the towns, small towns, villages, and they organized, you know, all the, the protests. So it was like, you know, very uh, uh, all over. I mean, like uh, uh, spread all over the country. So it wasn't just Poznan, Warsaw, Krakow, Gdańsk, or something like that. But also, small towns protested against this government, and it was really important. And it triggered, I think, it triggered. Uh, a, the, the, the change. Yes, and then the, when they <clears throat> when the young people, even those that they were still in the under voting age, but they were chanting "fuck yeah. peace," and then so they didn't forget it for three years, you yeah. know. So like it would be very stupid for them now to vote for something that where they were <laughs> uh, chanting against. Uh, so it was very very uh, important, and also like the mobilization of women um, that really went to yeah. vote because. If not for women, we would be still in the same um, fascism that we had. Sorry. <laughs> so yes, um, sorry to be talking about Poland so much, but we are very proud. I think that uh, also the turnout. This is something very uh, worth uh, underlining that the turnout was really, really huge. It was the highest turnout ever. I think it was ten percent higher higher than the historical eighty nine um, uh, elections. So it was like almost seventy four percent, and in the big cities it was like eighty six. Um, percent so almost so everybody voted basically and uh, and this is also a very important and also many people voted for people not necessarily for the party but also for people who are lower 
that means that people really were aware of who they are voting for. And this is also like this proves that we just made the lesson of the eight years of suppression that we started to really learn about politics more and about the people who um, represent us. Um, all right. So, yes, I think you just also underlined the, this kind of manipulation and this kind of like the method of the bo boiling the frog here. Yeah? So like it was very gradual because I, this is also probably true in uh, all of us and uh, in all, all, uh, our uh, countries. And um, also, I remember the text from, I was actually uh, having some presentations about it, and I analyzed the text, how we reacted to uh, to the taking uh, the power uh, of by the right wing. And I remember still in 2016, 17, yet there were texts like, oh, well, nothing, nothing is going on. Nothing has changed, really, because these changes were so gradual that they yes. were not really... Yeah so easily noticeable and then i remember kuba schroeder who wrote this um and eva majeska they wrote this one text that they used this uh, uh, uh phrase that so far so good you know this is about the guy who is falling from the skyscraper and he says like so far so good it's like you know it doesn't matter how you fall it matters how you fall uh, or how you end up yeah so this is um so they were like uh, predicting the the future but uh, people were trying to like comforting themselves like oh you know like it's it's okay um but but if, if in the end it was not okay and also there is a, a lot of what we you were all talking about is a lot of conformism so people who were yet um uh, you know like before they were not supporting the government but all of a sudden when the uh, government changes they start supporting it and they and also like uh, i think i remember it was a case of turkey i don't know if it's also in the other cases that business uh, really went on to uh, uh, you know together with the government and banks and everything so it just creates all these um potential sponsors yeah and and all of that that creates also uh, extra problems because then you don't have any space you know, any chance to get anything alternative because obviously uh then uh, you don't have any chance for alternative funding um all right so let's uh, maybe and then you know like about the future of poland like do you think like we have a chance of removing the blasphemy law and the defamation law and all these things i don't i don't know i think that um it won't be possible over the next um, next 10 years uh it needs i mean the, the youngest generation needs to um they they need to um uh, 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 um uh, enter the political the political scene so they need to be in their 40s and then probably you know the, this generation which is now in the 20s uh, uh in its 20s it has a chance or it will have a chance to change the, the um, um, blasphemy law Wow, that doesn't sound very <laughs> optimistic. Um, but okay. will, will be still alive, I hope. <laughs> Fine. Um, so uh, maybe Sarah, we will, could, could uh, tell us uh, also because you know, uh, I know you did. Do you believe in this power of uh, international solidarity? So you mentioned some ways forward in the beginning, like in your presentation. But how do you think, like how we as ICA, for example, could uh, start collaborating with the Council of Europe or other organizations just to uh, to to uh, move forward a little bit? Well, yes, I have to say this, this conversation is very inspiring, especially how much time is uh, being given to solutions to the, uh, the supportive activities. And I have to say one thing of working with, with the arts community compared to when I've been working between rights defenders, legal and others, is the way that you can actually mobilize public support. Because images, music, etc., it really grabs the attention of the wider public and you can get support through that like the banana gate uh, initiative of everybody laughing and you know making their own take they didn't need to be artists and also i was thinking of a case in brazil where um an exhibition of queer musician um queer museum uh had to be closed down after right-wing uh activist uh t attacked it now they attacked the audience they didn't attack the world artworks they went into the uh galleries with um with uh with the mobile phones and took videos of the audience what, looking at certain images and then put them online saying, this is what a pedophile looks like. Yeah. 
So the risk that uh, we had to remember the risk that the audience takes by going in and identifying themselves with solidarity. But the good thing about that was there was such an outcry about it that another gallery, I think it was in Rio, took uh, on the exhibition and it turned out to be the most popular exhibition of all. They had queues of thousands of people willing to put themselves physically in that space with the other artists. So that's really important to me, is that the way that we should remember that you have a power as artists to reach out in a way that others don't, and that the fan base and the audience base, and that the audience take huge risks themselves. I mean, it's been the audiences who have died most in the love of music, if you look at the terrorist attacks in, in Manchester or Bataclan or in, in Myanmar recently. Um, is that um, just to remember that you do have this great reach out there, and sometimes I don't hear the name uh, support of the audience uh, being 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 enough there. And also, they are the bigger funders of, of of art. They are the ones that pay the tickets and go in. Yeah, so they need to be uh, work more 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 closely with them. I think it's really important to have a place where we can exchange these ideas and initiatives not just moan. <laughs> and one of the initiatives that's coming out of, which I should be recommending to the Council of Europe as a result of my discussion with all of you, is to find a way that these institutions can support platforms and places of exchange. Now, many of these organizations, like the Council of Europe, you'll remember that I cannot name and shame when I'm writing a report, which is very interesting. Um, but at least we're looking at, at, at solutions. There are mechanisms such as the United Nations Special Rapporteur on Culture, who, uh, who had been focusing on different ex, uh, aspects of cultural rights, early on on freedom of artistic expression, also other areas, teaching of history, etc. And I think, and I'll check, but I think she is about to make a call for um, uh, uh, reports and inclusion on academic freedom. I will do that and I'll let you know if, if I'm right and we can get the contact for her. They actively invite um, uh, information from civil society organizations and others because one has to remember that even though these are big institutions, for instance, the Special Rapporteur on Culture has, uh, she's a volunteer, she's a professor of law uh, in Brunel in London and has one and a half staff. So they're reliant on you feeding them and also to, but also to be, uh, you know, to have an understanding of what they need. That's a whole other bigger top, topic. So definitely um, these institutions are incredibly frustrating to work with, but when you can find a place or supporters that we have done, the Council of Europe and some aspect of the UN. Um, I think the idea of funding for the safe space, emergency exit, other kind of initiatives um, is really important. Um, they're more likely to come from the funders, maybe from the EU, but also there are the uh, big funders like in Sweden, you've got the Swedish uh, International Development Association and others um, who might be, might feel less politically constrained that sometimes there is a problem. I know the Council of Europe would not fund uh, a project which is seen to be anti one of their member states. Yeah, very interesting to work with that. But um, yeah, I have to say this is really for me to have a place where we can share these ideas and to find out that they're across, they're not just in Europe or they're not just in Iran or Japan. And I've seen some similar um, comments that you've made here from uh, Northern Iraq, for instance. So it'd be really nice to have that and to have this place to share in person, in paper, whatever. And that's maybe something that we could go to the EU or other institutional funders for, because they do like to see solution oriented <laughs> actions and, 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 and to find a way of supporting them. So this has been a fantastic discussion. So thank you, Margazata. Thank you. Uh, yes, well, so um, now I think I would like to open the, the discussion and then we have the question for William Messer. Are not art critics writers also experiencing censorship and control? What role do you all think that art critics should play in the resistance and protection of artistic freedom? Who would like to answer this question? 
I can go first. Um, you know, I I don't I haven't myself experienced any, any kind of censorship uh, or control directly. But uh, when the IG Triennale 2019 controversy happened, uh, I, and I wrote about the controversy within the first two weeks um, of of its spilling out into the public. I was definitely aware that, um, you know, because so much of the harassment campaign had been happening online, I was very, very much aware that I could be subjected to, um, you know, harassment or doxing uh, or other forms of um, sort of, uh, um, you know, quasi violence or, or, or uh, psychological violence. Um, so, you know, I think definitely when we write uh, we 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 do have to um, sort of face up to that, and uh, and I think it's important to follow one's principles or follow one's ethics in, in uh, writing. I've also been in cases more on, in organizational situations where you know I've I've spoken up critically uh, for issues like gender balance, uh, for example. Where you know I knew it was an unpopular opinion and and there could be repercussions, uh, but it was just something that I felt strongly about, um, you know. And I think it's just important to to set an example, you know, it, when you can, I guess. Um, can, can I add, and add to the point of this? It strikes me that there is an interlink between uh, art critics and journalism and media. And as you probably know that artistic freedom, um, uh, media freedom is really strong um, and that uh, journalists have networks and mechanisms. So I would maybe suggest that there be uh, some sharing liaison between uh, some of the, art the media freedom organizations as well. I do know that they're looking out to, um, to exchange more. What I do find sometimes though, is that there's a lack of understanding of the cultural sector, um, but that, well, that's what you can bring uniquely uh, straddling that um, media journalism. And uh, you also have a capacity, capacity to write a lot better than I think some of my human rights and legal people do when I read their material. Oh my God, you know, you've got to be able to communicate better than that. <laughs> Right, Firat and Gregory. <laughs> yeah, uh, personally, um, after the coup attempt in Turkey in 2016, and after that, Ms. Beral Madra, who is the honorary president of ICA Turkey, you know that she's very professional in the curatorial ship and the art writing sector for a long years. And then uh, Beral Madre at that time was the artistic director of the Çanakkale de Hades Pontos Biennale. And after the coup attempt, there was a gathering in Istanbul in Yenikapı district. The government and the opposite parties and all the parties, I can say, did a gathering there against the coup attempt, etc. Anyway, so Beral Madre on <coughs> her Twitter account a statement that this gathering looks like looked like uh, Nuremberg uh, gatherings or something like that. It's a very sensitive issue, uh, wrong or right, anyway. But it's a freedom of expression. So uh, a member of parliament from that region um, pointed out to Beral Madra and accused of Çanakkale Bayanale that they have to uh, release Beral Madra of that position. Uh, and then Beral Madra had to leave. And after that, I wrote an article about this issue. Uh, and I really insisted to publish that article on art magazines, not on a, a leftist newspapers. I, I've been written many articles for the leftist uh, newspapers in Turkey. But at that time, I thought that this article and this issue must be published in a regular art magazine. But uh, I didn't find anyone because uh, the regular art magazines uh, at that time 
couldn't show any courageous, uh, courageous uh, behavior of that. So it's not a censorship, but uh, they weren't brave at that time. I'm not accused of some editors. I'm not accused of no one uh, because it's a very sensitive issue. So that's why you can feel that how the editors feels in Turkey sometimes. Um, and for the second questions, we have a limited power to fight against all the things. Uh, so we are not a hero. So we can fight, we can make an awareness of something, we can make visible of some sensitive issues anyway, but on the other hand, uh, for solving this kind of problems, uh, maybe a person uh, can join in a, a, a liberal party or democrat party or socialist party whenever are not about just art it's about the politics so that's why sometimes maybe we can find a way uh, to solve this kind of problems in uh... okay uh, sorry because you got uh, uh, cut a little bit but uh, so you now go uh, Gerke? Just, yeah, thank you. Just very quickly, I would like to join uh, Sarah in terms of um, when she said that we cannot separate what is happening to the art journalists from other kind of journalists. Uh, we are in the same boat. Yeah, I absolutely uh, agree. Um, the same thing is happening to us, uh, art critics and art journalists, as it as happens to other um, the journalists from other fields. Um, self-censorship, um, softer or harsh oppression, softer or harsh lack of representation, uh, the same problems we have. But at the same time, I, I also experienced a kind of vacuum situation, at least here in, in the Hungarian context, because we as our journalists don't really belong to the journalist community and don't, belong to, don't really belong to the art community as well. So we are somewhere in between. When it comes uh, to representation and once when it comes to the um, uh, to voices to be heard, uh, it's just not easy to to you know to find the right channels. And also, I would go back to the question of sustainability and to the question of funding. In Hungary, the government just doesn't do anything with the, with the art journalists; they just let them die, just let the art magazines die. The no public um we had we had four major uh, art magazines here in the country print and online and only one is active right at, at this moment and one went was downgraded under and became a subsection of a culture section somewhere um, and it goes back to 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 the question of funding the only one that survives can only survive because they made compromises and they accepted money from the MMA, from the Hungarian Academy of Art, you know, and therefore they do not write about the political context, about the institutional context. They try to concentrate on the so-called autonomous art, which is obviously just not autonomous anymore. Um, so if you don't touch upon certain subjects, you can survive. But otherwise, it is very hard to maintain these fragile st structures, even for, for bigger publishing companies. Okay, thank you. Jakub, would you like to uh, add something? Um, I, I just, I, I can just repeat uh, what uh, uh, Gergi said that uh, in terms of uh, in terms of uh, our journalists, the most dangerous uh, pressure um, comes from the economic field. I mean, uh, from sponsor grant donors and uh, advertisers, and this is very a uh, very tricky situation. Uh, tricky situation and um, actually really, really hard to to um, uh, to track down, to expose, and to show how it works. Yeah, so so that's the main problem in case of Poland, uh, for instance, uh, with our journalists. Mm -hmm. Well, I think also the the problem is the shrinking space for art criticism uh, in general because in everyday newspapers, yes, because it's just dying out, absolutely. And um, because especially on the local level, 
<clears throat> I remember when I was working in Kalish in a small town, and uh, it was the, the role of this art, the critic that was writing for this local newspaper was enormous. Like she actually basically removed one of the directors just because of the theater because she didn't like her. And, uh, and uh, on the other hand, she liked me. And it was, I don't know why, uh, but, and she was also actually, she knew about theater. And it was actually funny because in one of the few uh, months of my being there, I think it was like third month or something like that, uh, an artist made a, um, it was like a big event. I invited an artist and he was displaying things in three public uh, spaces, huge projections. And, uh, and then just 10 minutes before uh, we turned it on, he told me, oh, I have a surprise for you. It's going to be a text from Golgotha Picnic. And Golgotha Picnic, like a few months uh, earlier, was totally banned from, it was Golgotha Picnic, the, the play by Rodrigo Garcia, right? Uh, that was about the, the Jesus Christ and all that stuff. And it was it was removed from Mal Malta Festival. And, and there was an enormous scandal about it. And I thought, and of course, it was only the text. Uh, and I, in the beginning, I thought that nobody is going to really uh, discover this. But of course, that critic discovered this because she knew everything about theater. But because she wrote about it in a very enthusiastic, positive way, then the authorities didn't do anything because it, because they really read this. And then they really, you know, like the, it influences their opinions about things. Um, so in a way, uh, so this is also so wild that we, we, when we remove these uh, people from newspapers, everyday newspapers, also there is nothing to uh, really, there's nobody to support us, yeah, in this, uh, especially, and I'm talking about small, um, small uh, places, because now we were concentrating now on Budapest, Warsaw, you know, like big cities, but of course the culture is comprises of all these small uh, um, uh, towns and galleries that uh, also create the, uh, the whole situation. All right, so any other uh, questions? We have a huge, uh, Sarah uh, has to um, leave us, so, Thank you, uh, Sarah, for your contribution. And there is only, um, we probably will meet again <laughs> soon. And um, we have uh, we have a comment from Nilfur. Uh, thank you for this very important discussion as I invite you to join the ICAF Freedom of Expression Committee. It can greatly benefit from your experience and make it effective. This will give us another global platform. Many of the censorship experience resonate with that we are coping with in. Pakistan, uh, political actors here are particularly sensitive to art that creates a uh, dialogue, uh, sorry, uh, I skipped it, uh, creates dialogue opportunities in the public space. This makes them feel very threatened. In this context, the Karachi Biennale was founded to instrumentalize art to unite a fractured society after extreme violence in our city. Uh, Karachi Biennale largely works under the ra radar to navigate the hostile environment. We push the envelope with critical awareness of national issues and uh, Nilfur uh, became the head of the censorship committee so of course uh, we are going to uh, cooperate and we have a question of, uh, from Shikoko uh, Ida uh, what do you think about autonomy of curators and exhibition organizers protecting and securing freedom of expression of artists but even violate such rights of cu for curators and organizers I feel that there is a kind of a contradiction although I think that both ends should have co-authorship well, uh, it's a very, <laughs> it's a huge point. So you have to discuss it at another time, I think. But uh, recently, maybe you heard that, as I told in my speech. So that's why I pointed out to not just the governments so about the private organizations or even foundations, because lastly, maybe you heard that the uh, advisory board of the Istanbul Biennale appointed a curator advice, let's say, uh, as um, Defne Ayas, but uh, the directory of the Istanbul Culture and Arts Foundation decided to uh, appoint Ivona Blazbek, as far as I remember her name, uh, as a curator of the next edition of Istanbul Biennale. So that's why some members of the advisory board uh, left their position uh, in the advisory board of the Biennale. So in this case, uh, we can understand that easily. So the foundations and the directors and the decision makers sometimes can, uh, let's say, uh, 
didn't don't feel that they have to do the right thing so they can decide uh, in another way uh, and also uh, for the creators sometimes yes maybe I can agree with the uh, questions maybe we can discuss about the autonomy of creators and exhibition organizers in next time but that's the uh, examples uh, the last examples that I can give you and another case in 2016 as far as I remember there was a uh, curator exhibition in Istanbul the winner was Katya Krupenikova from Ukraine and at that time uh, Katya Krupenikova uh, was about to open the exhibition but at that time we did leave a tragic bombing in Ankara at that time so over a hundred people get killed for the ISIS bombing. So uh, in the exhibition, as far as I remember, there is a Kurdish artist's video about uh, uh, about um, killings in 1990s uh, without anyone of accusing. Uh, so uh, the director of the Akbar Sanat uh, canceled the exhibition in just one day uh, and no need to give any public announcement about that. So sometimes the directors, sometimes curators, sometimes even maybe writer, I don't know, but it's about the personality, it's about the power, I think. Sometimes uh, maybe <laughs> you agree with me. The main problem is that if you give someone to a uh, whole power, so it's gonna be a real problem like we live in Turkey right now. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, would like to be next. Well, I just I would like to just men mention uh, uh, the role of the copyright uh, copyright in the situation. I mean, it's a kind of shield and a, a weapon which can be effectively used against um, curators and uh, exhibition organizers. So actually, it's a it's a huge topic. It's a huge topic. <laughs> Probably you need to we need to uh, set another conversation about it but uh, copyright law might be very useful for, for artists and very dangerous for the, the organizers of exhibitions yes and it was used actually already right because yeah, uh, many times, many times. yes because artists were withdrawing their uh the um, artworks from exhibitions based on the, the the copyrights and sometimes these things are not really Clear, yes, and so they are using these uh, uh, holes and so on, so on. Right, um, okay, so um, do we have any other questions? I think this is uh, already taking longer than I expected. <laughs> so uh, thank you so much. Um, I think we uh, already even have um, an idea for another meeting. So that's uh, that's great, and I think uh, we really should be in touch, and also um, we should be in touch uh, not only uh, in within with ourselves and then within ICA, but also with uh, all these organizations that external organizations are external from ICA. Uh, I mean the the Council of Europe, the Free News, uh, the Artistic Freedom Initiative, because they have also the power and the um, the know how and the methodology of dealing with the the subject and uh, we can also uh, actively cooperate with them to push the uh, things forward. So thank you again and uh, see you next time. <laughs>